Time to remind you a little bit about volume in case you didn't take the picture before for your phone. There it is in front of you. And I want to go back to the idea that, in my opinion, the best way for a student to understand volume is to teach it as the area of the base times the height. And then if it comes to a point at the top, you divide by three. And we'll go so through some examples of that now. First, why is it so helpful to understand that volume is the area of the base times the height? So here is a rectangular prism. And a prism is basically a shape that is equal on both ends, meaning the right and left hand side of this, and it's a rectangle all the way through. So um, it does not change to a point at the end or it doesn't taper off at the end. So look, if I wanted to find the volume of this, what I'm really asking is how much is on the inside? That's what volume is in three dimensions, not two. And if I look at just the bottom and I say, what's the area of the bottom? Well, I have four rows of two each. So the area of the bottom is four times two, which is eight. And then when I want to know the volume, well, I have two levels here because the height is two. So I have to do that eight times two, which is 16. So in other words, I have eight blocks on the bottom and eight blocks on the top. So altogether, I have 16 blocks. So if I look at that from a area of the base times the height point of view, I don't look at the whole figure right away. I look at the base. And the base in this figure is, the area of it is 4 times 2. And then that gives me 8. Now I also multiply by the height because it's how many levels there are of the base. And 8 times 2 is 16. Or I could just do the formula for volume, which is length times width times height. And 4 times 2 times 2 is 16. So either way I get 16. But here's the problem. The problem is particularly when your students are asked to remember the formulas, is that there are many different solid shapes. And you would be asking them to remember a different formula for every one of those shapes. For instance, um, a cylinder is pi r squared h. A sphere is 4 thirds pi r, pi r cubed. The uh, rectangular prism is length times width times height. The um, pyramid would be, um, let, let's just go on a square pyramid, it would be side squared times the height divided by 3. If I go for a rectangular period, it's length times the width times the height divided by 3. So there's many different shapes, and each one has their own formula. It's so much easier to just remember the area of the base times the height, and then the caveat that if it comes to a point, we're going to divide by 3. Okay? You do it whichever way you're most comfortable doing it. Okay? So... You hear me saying, but, but I really like the area in the base times the height. So I would suggest you go that way. All right, let's find this one. For your sake, I'm going to do these both ways. Go ahead. Okay, so I, I just chewed some ice, and I know that drives certain people crazy. I'm sorry if you're one of them. Uh, again, you know me. I like my area of the base times the height. So the area of the base is 24, right? Because it's 6 times 4. Multiply that by the height, which is 5, and I get 120. But what if you're one of these formula lovers? You could just do length times width times height, which is 6 times 4 times 5, which is also 120. Whatever floats your boat, whatever you enjoy. Try this one. Okay, again, I like area of the base times the height. So that would be 12 times 5 gives me the base, which is 60. Multiplying that by the height, which is 3, and I get 180. If you prefer length times width times height, you just do 12 times 5 times 3, and it's 180. The thing I don't like about length times width times height is this, you don't understand the concept behind it, whereas you do understand the concept behind it when it comes to um, area of the base times height. Okay. Now is when I think you really start getting an advantage out of it. I mean, look at this. We have this terrible formula that says pi r squared times h, which is the height. Or I could just look at it as, hey, wait a minute, I already know the formula for the area of a circle. Area of a circle, apple pies r2. Area of a circle is pi r squared. r squared, r is 4, squared it's 16, so I get 16 pi, which as a decimal would be 50.2656. It's approximately the same, not exactly. Um, and then I have to multiply by the height. The height is 10, so I multiply that by 10, and I get 502.656. You try this cylinder.
Okay, so in this case, the area of the base is going to be pi r squared, which is pi times 25 squared, which is, oh God, <sighs> another mistake. 25 squared, 25 squared is 625. I know that right off the top of my head, I don't even need a calculator for it. So 3.1416 times 625 will get me 1963.5. And then I have to do that times 40. Is 78,540. Okay, let's go back to playing this one wrong. So the area of a, a circle is pi times r squared. In this case, the radius is 25. So I square that, I get 625 pi. And when I multiply 625 times pi is 1963.5 square centimeters. Just in case you're asking, how do I make these stupid mistakes? It's really, really easy. Um, PowerPoint, which these presentations are, it takes a long time to go in and do insert symbol and go to the Greek alphabet and um, put on the exponents and everything. So what I'll do is I'll do it once for one problem and then I'll do copy and paste and then I'll change all the numbers. But sometimes I forget to change a number. And when I forget to change a number, you get the result that happened last time. It's not that I don't know how to do it. It's that I just in going through it, I must have gone too quickly and not noticed that I didn't change that number. Okay. So um, 1963.5 square meters is the area of that circle. But if I want the volume of the cylinder, I have to multiply that by the height because it's as if these, there's 40 levels of this circle or 40 circles, hockey pucks, if you will, stacked on top of each other. So that total volume would then be 1963, which is a fine year that I was born in, 0.5 times 40, which is 78,540 square meters. Or cubic, sorry, cubic meters. All right, next up. I'm going to let you play with this for a minute before I show you the answers. This was a, a question on an old Regents exam. Basically, you have the structure and you're asked to find the volume that sits, fits inside the structure. And everything you need to know is outlined in the diagram itself so you don't have to worry about whatever you're missing in the top of that, top sentence of that question. Go ahead. Okay, so we have an irregular figure here. It's made up of a rectangular prism on the bottom, and it's made up of a pyramid on the top. And if I put those two volumes together, I have the total volume in cubic feet of space that the tent occupies. So the first thing I'm going to do is realize that the total volume is the volume of the pyramid plus the volume of the prism. So let's do the prism first. The prism will be the area of the base, which is 64, times the height, which is 9. That works out to be 576 cubic feet. You could also look at it as um, just length times width times height. However you want to look at it, it's up to you. Now we need to do the volume of the pyramid. Now the pyramid has the same base, 8 times 8. But now the height is 3. So the volume of the period will be, pyramid will be 1 third. Because anytime you come to a point, like happens here, you divide by 3. That's why the 1 thirds there. The area of the base, which is 8 times 8, times the height, which is 3. And if I do 1 third times 8 times 8 times 3, I get 64 cubic feet. I add them up, and I get 576 plus 64, which is 640 cubic feet. Right? Volume will always be cubed. Three dimensions in volume. Okay, try this one. Go ahead. Right, a little more straightforward on this one. The volume of a pyramid is one third times the area of the base. That's 60 times 60 times the height, which is 84. Now that comes out to a volume of 100,800 cubic inches. But notice in italics, oh, what are they asking for? Nearest cubic foot. So now I need to do some conversions. 100,800 100, divided by and since it's feet cubed, it's a 12, a 12, and a 12. 
one for each dimension. And when I do that, I get 58.3 repeating, which is choice three. Um, I'm sorry, choice two. <laughs> choice two, 58.3 repeating. All right, next up, Ian needs to replace two concrete sections in his sidewalk as modeled below. Each section is 36 inches by 36 inches by four inches deep. And then we have to charge per cubic foot. I sure hope I adjusted for cubic feet in this problem. For some reason, I think I might not have. Go ahead. How much to replace the two, not the one, but two concrete sections? So I did this late last night and I'm sitting here going, oh man, I don't remember too much of what I did here. I hope I didn't forget to do something. So I may catch myself in a mistake here again. So it's 36 times 36 for the square times four inches, which gives me 5,184 inches cubed. And oh, fortunately there are two of them. So I double that and I get 10,368 cubic inches for the two sections. So the top number 5184, that's how many cubic inches for one section of the sidewalk. And then the second section, I got it times by two. So for both sections, it's 10,368. And then I have to divide that by, because it wants to go to cubic foot. Fortunately, I didn't get this wrong. Dividing by the cubic feet, which means I have to divide by 12 and 12 and 12 again, because in each case I'm converting from inches to feet. And I get six feet cubed. I still haven't gotten to the right answer yet because it wants to know how much money it's going to cost to replace this. And that's 325 per cubic foot. So six times 325 is 1950 altogether for the charge. All right, so that's volume of irregular figures. Last part of this lesson, quiz will be upcoming.